Hi everybody, welcome back to my video. This is, I believe, third video of the challenge. I may be a little off on that. Um, of the, the Love Dare Challenge, the Marriage Challenge, and by Stephen and Alex Kendrick. And today we are on day nine, and it is about Love Makes Good Impressions. And it says, greet one another with a kiss of love. And that's in 1 Peter 5, 14. Kings bow while soldiers salute. Acquaintances wave while friends shake hands. And families embrace while lovers kiss. Greetings provide us with a dynamic way to encounter one another and show appropriate affection and respect. Each greeting depends upon the nature and close closeness of each relationship. Did you know that you can tell a lot about the current status of a couple's marriage by the way they greet one another? You can see it in her smile, hear it in her voice, and sense it in the tenderness of their touch or lack thereof. A greeting can be a litmus test for a relational health. Think about it. What do you and your mate reveal about the relationship simply by how you greet one another? And I wrote, I think about this occasionally. We aren't as lovey-dovey as we used to be. Definitely my fault. Um, David, David is a um, very handsy, feely kind of guy, but he, but he always seems to get this way in the most inconvenient times. It's usually when I'm trying to cook, or I'm trying to clean, or I'm trying to. Um, we're tending to James and and I, I feel bad about that but at the same time as it's when he feels most affectionate towards me <laughs> um, I usually give him a quick kiss before he leaves for work or when he comes home and we don't show as much public display of affection anymore either which might be good for some people, but we were pretty lovey-dovey when we first got together. <clears throat> but that just shows you how what time does and what children do. And I need to work on that and make sure that time and children and stress and life in general just doesn't, doesn't interfere with our love for each other and showing each other. Okay. And then it went on to saying, is it caring? I'm still trying to be caring when I'm loving on him. Or is it callous? Do your greetings cause your spouse to look forward to seeing you? And I wrote, he's probably ready to get home and see his family when he comes home for work. But it's probably not the greeting that he's looking forward to. It says, some people don't get greet warmly because they feel insincere. They claim, I'm being true to how I feel. And then I wrote with that, and I said, I do have that issue sometimes. Um, especially when I've had, we have a, a recent argument. I don't want to be all lovey-dovey towards him. And I know I should just be like, show him love anyway. But like it, I underlined it here, I'm, I feel like I'm being true to how I feel inside. I don't want him just to feel like that I agree with or, or, or I don't want him to feel like that I'm caving in. But apparently in this book it says, there are many good reasons to be kind even when feelings are contrary. Love being the, gre the greatest reason of all. Rock greetings can reflect what's currently happening in relationship they can also become a loving investment in its future health. Throughout history, the Jewish people demonstrated an understanding of power of an effective greeting. Used more than 200 times in the Bible, the word salome, meaning peace and tranquility, was a word intentionally employed to greet others. They used it to say, have a long life, peace be with you. And peace be to your house, and peace to be to all you have. And that's in 1 Samuel 25, 6. This word still used today. 
reveals how a daily greeting can be turned to a dynamic blessing. You don't have to say salam when greeting your mate, but sharing a strong five second greeting each day with your spouse can become a long term blessing to your relationship. David likes to say a 30 second hug can help any situation. <laughs> like he said, it can make you feel, can't remember the exact words he uses, but supposedly a 30 second hug can de stress you and make you feel closer to somebody or something like that. Your greeting should say, you're priceless to me rather than you are tolerated by me. And I underlined that because I thought those were pretty spectacular words. You're priceless to me rather than you're tolerated by me. Because I feel like a lot of times people do feel like when you're in a marriage, in a marriage they're just being tolerated. So, yeah. Hopefully David doesn't feel that way. <laughs> I don't feel that way. Jesus noted that even pagans speak kindly to people they like. That's easy for any anyone to do. And I underlined this next part. But God's children, he said, are meant to be humble and gracious enough to address even their enemies with kindness. And I'm going to say that again because a lot of people don't do this. But God's children, he said, are meant to be humble and gracious enough to address even their enemies with kindness. This raises the question... How do you greet your friends, co-workers, and neighbors? How about acquaintances you see in public? You may even encounter someone you don't necessarily like and still acknowledge them out of courtesy. And I said in, I said I, I do hugs to my friends and family, maybe a kiss to family, and I smile to nod and nod to everybody else. So if if you're this polite to others, don't you? doesn't your spouse deserve the same times 10? It can be simple as what you say when you wake up in the morning, the look on your face when you get in the car, the energy in your voice when you're on the phone. Consider the difference it would make in your spouse's day if everything about you expressed the fact that you're really, really glad to see them. A good greeting sets the stage for a positive, healthy interaction. Like love, it makes a person feel value, valued and puts wind in their sails for better moments ahead. Sorry if you can hear James playing in the background. <laughs> Think back to the story Jesus told of the prodigal son. This young rebellious man demanded his inheritance money and then wasted it on the fullest lifestyle. But soon his poor choices caught up with him and he found himself eating scraps in a, in a pig pen. Humbled and ashamed, he practiced his apologies before going home to face his father. But the greeting he anticipated was not the one that he, the one that he received. I had to talk to me. The one in his <clears throat> While he was still a long way Daddy, off, his mommy, father I saw him. I don't know if father saw him, but Daddy. And felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And that's Luke 15 20. This greeting was likely the last thing the son expected. But how do you think it made him feel to receive the father's embrace and hear his thankful tone? Overwhelmed? Overwhelmed? Deeply loved? Treasured again? What do you think it did to their relationship? What kind of greetings would cause your mate to feel like that? How could you excite his or her senses with kinder word, a, a more affectionate touch, and a more gracious tone of voice? A loving greeting is a gift you can give your spouse every day by what they see, hear, and feel. It is priceless in value while costing you nothing. Think of the opportunities you give to greet each other on a regular basis. When coming in the door, when meeting for lunch, when saying good night, I underlined that because I do try to give I do try to give David a kiss even when he's asleep and I'm coming to bed. I try to give him a kiss and tell him I love him. So that's something I try to do every night. When talking or texting on the phone, it doesn't have to be bold and dramatic every time, but adding warmth and enthusiasm gives you the chance to touch your mate's heart in unexpected ways. Countless widows and widowers could tell us with tears in their eyes 
what it can mean for them to have one more chance to greet, kiss, and hold their spouses. Since we have no guarantee of tomorrow, every day with our spouse is a gift from God for us to cherish and enjoy. And I'm going to say that again because that's very important. Since we each have no guarantee of tomorrow, every day with our spouse is a gift from God for us to cherish and enjoy. Think about your greeting. Do you use it well? And I said, it needs work. Does your spouse feel appreciated? And I said, probably not as much as he should. Do they feel loved? Even when they're not getting, when you're not getting along too well, you can lessen the tension and help turn things around by the way you bless them when you greet them. Remember, love is a choice. So choose to love them at hello. And I also wrote in, I also need to work on my good morning. Some mornings I give him a kiss and a hug. And in some mornings I just walk in and act like, I don't say anything at all. I just go along with my day, and I might come over. I might come over and basically like talk to him about something random, because when he works at home in the mornings, I might not even say good morning. So I need, I do need to work on that. Okay, today's dare. It says, think of a specific way you'd like to greet your spouse today. Do it with a smile and with enthusiasm. Then determined to change your greeting to daily reflect more love for them. All right, that's the end for today's. Hello, welcome to day 10. Yes, I am in my PJs. I am pregnant and tired and have allergies and don't feel great. I have a cough too. Um, and I don't plan on going anywhere today. I've just been cleaning house. So I think I deserve to stay in my PJs if I want to. But I don't know if I've ever not, um, mentioned this before, but when I was in college, we were, I was taking one of my family classes, and the lady, or this uh, girl sitting behind me said that her mom gets dressed every morning, puts her makeup on, and does her hair, which sounds exactly like my grandmother. <laughs> but it shows that uh, she loves her husband and wants to look good for him. Do I get a free pass from that right now? Because <laughs> I'm pregnant. Oh, I don't know. I, that's my goal is to always look good for my husband, but I'm just not up to it right now. But anyway, <clears throat> I did yesterday's dare, and it was on the Love Makes Good Impressions, and it was, um, I ended up writing, when David got home from work today, I was cooking dinner. But I went and said hello and gave him a kiss. I wasn't overly enthusiastic because I could tell he was tired and was in some pain. I could tell my greeting was appreciated, but not, maybe not his top priority, which was fine because I knew he just wanted to get in and get comfortable. From this point on, I will try to always greet him with a smile and a kiss. I will also show him enthusiasm that I am glad he's home and show him that I have missed him. I will also ask him how work was, was, which I usually do anyway. And this reminds me of a book that I read before. It's usually about a 50s wife who greets his, her husband when he gets home from work, has his favorite cocktail in his hand, and puts him in his recliner and lets him rest. And also he has the, the children are quiet and now the room and the house is all clean. That was another one of my goals. Uh, maybe... Not the cocktail if he doesn't want a cocktail. Depends on the day. <laughs> but yeah. Okay. So I finished that there. And now we're going on to day 10. And it is love is unconditional. God demonstrates his own love towards us. In, the, in that while we were yet seniors. Cried, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8 If someone were to ask you. Why do you love your wife or why do you love your husband? What would you say? And I wrote down, um, it's because he's a provider. He loves me and my kids. And then it went on to say, most men would mention their wife's beauty, her sense of humor, her kindness, or her inner strength. They might talk about her cooking, her knack of decorating, or what a good mother she is. 
women would probably say something about their husband's good looks or his personality, which David does have a good personality. They commend him for his steadiness and consistent character. They say they love him because he's always there for them. He's generous, he's helpful. Which David is all those. But what if over the years your wife or husband stopped being every one of these? Would you still love them? Based on your answers above, the only logical response would be no. If your reasons for loving your spouse all has something to do with his or her qualities, and then those same qualities suddenly or gradually disappear, your basis for love is over. The only way to love can last a lifetime if it is unconditional. The truth is, lasting love is not determined by the one being loved, but rather by the one choosing to love. The Bible refers to this kind of love by using the Greek word agape. It differs from other types of love like philo and eros. Philo is friendship and er eros is sexual love. Both friendship and sex have an important place in marriage, of course, but are a big part of the house, yet you, you build together as husband and wife. But if your marriage totally depends on having common interest or enjoying a healthy sex life, then the foundation for your relationship is unstable. Philo and Eros are more responsive in nature and can fluctuate based upon feelings. When someone says, I've fallen in love with you, it is a filio or arrows love. These are fickle and can change depending upon circumstances. It is important to recognize that it's, it is, that it's possible to allow yourself to fall in and out of love with multiple people throughout your life. And I have to admit that I've loved three people. <laughs> um... Which isn't too many, right? That's why we should guard our hearts from others, guarding it for our spouse alone. And I know David loved one other person before me, but I do want to teach my kids to guard their heart, not just give it away easily. At the same time, I, I'm glad that I dated around. That sounds bad. That I dated a lot because it showed me when I found David what I really really wanted in a husband so but you should just give away your heart either as I was reading this devotional challenge this morning I realized that I've already kind of done some of the things that it says um so I already checked off that I've done it um it says have you has your love tickly been based on your spouse's attributes and behavior or have you based it instead on your own commitment? How can you continue to show love when it's not returned in any way you hope for? I wrote, I have done the dishes, laundry, and folded the laundry. I feel like these are some of the duties of just being a wife. And I guess by doing these things, I show David how much I love him. I'm not being lazy. I have more plans today to clean. Um, even though... I am big and pregnant, and I get tired fast, and my back hurts. Um, my love may sometimes be guided by David's attributes and his behavior, but I believe I also do it out of my commitment. I will continue to show my love even when it's not returned by doing things I have and will continue to learn in this book. Right now, I feel like this isn't an issue, but I want to keep it on track and not let it become an issue. All right, I will be back tomorrow. All right, day 11, and it is love cherishes. Husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Ephesians 5, 28. Consider these two scenarios. A man's older car begins having serious trouble, so he takes it to the mechanic. After an assessment is made, he is told it will need a complete overhaul, which will tax his limited budget. Because of the expensive repairs, he determines to get rid of the car and spend his funds on a new vehicle. Seems reasonable, right? And I wrote, 
this is, has actually happened to us. Um, David's car kind of broke down the other day, and or not the other day, a while back. And um, we were sitting there thinking, well, it's going to cost more to fix it than it would cost to just get a new car. Oh, and not a new car. We got a, um, we decided to get a used car. But yes, that happened to us. Okay. And then another man, an engineer, accidentally crushes his hand in a piece of equipment. He rushes to the hospital and has it x-rayed, finding that numerous bones are broken. Although frustrated and pain, he really uses his savings to have it doc doctored and placed in a cast and gingerly nurses it back to health over the following months. This too probably seems reasonable to you. The problem within our culture is that marriage is more often treated like the first scenario, a discardable possession. When your relationship experiences difficulty, you are urged to dump your spouse for a newer model. But those who have this view do not understand the significant bond between a husband and a wife. The truth is, marriage is more like a second scenario. You are part of one another. You would never cut off your hand if it was injured, but would pay whatever you could afford for the best medical treatment possible. That's because your hand is priceless to you. It is part of who you are. And so is your mate. Marriage is a beautiful mystery, mystery created by God, joining two lives together as one. This does not only happen physically, but spiritually and emotionally. You start off sharing the same house, the same bed, the same last name. Your identity as individuals has been joined into one. When you find success at a job, both of you rejoice. When one of you goes through the tragedy, both of you feel it. But somewhere along the way, you experience disappointment and pain. Your relationship gets broken. The so sobering reality you married a very imperfect person sets in. This, however, does not change the fact that your spouse is still part of you. Ephesians 5, 28 through 29 says, Husbands ought to also those who love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. The word cherish means to make warm. Imagine a newborn baby who feels alone, cold, hungry, and afraid, longing to be held. Then his new mother lovingly picks him up, nursing, caressing, and holding her infant child. 1 Thessalonians 2.7 Her careful attention and tender affection warms her baby both physically and emotionally. This is the biblical picture of how a husband and wife are to cherish one another. Life is cold and unpredictable. Everyday stress can wear us down. Rela relationships can sometimes be hard and go th through seasons of winter instead of those warm days of spring. It is our responsibility, every other person on the face of the earth, to step in and tenderly touch, caress, and warm the life and heart of our spouse. Much of this cherishing can be done in how we gently touch our mate in non-sexual ways. Coming up behind your wife at the sink and kissing her on the neck, reaching over in the car and caressing his arm, putting your arm around her while sitting in church, walking closely beside him and taking his hand, holding her while you watch a movie together, nourishing them with the warmth of their, your affection, Remember, when you show love to your spouse, you are showing love to yourself as well. And I underlined, coming up behind your wife in the sink and kissing her on the neck. And I said, David does do this. And reaching over in the car and caressing his arm, I like to place my hand on his leg while we're in the car and he's driving. Um, walking closely beside him and taking his hand and David does that with us. He actually did that on our second date and he still does that when we're out. <clears throat> He'll grab my hand while we're walking. But there is a flip side to the coin. When you mistreat your mate, you're also mistreating yourself. Think about it. Your lives are now intro interwoven together. Your spouse cannot experience joy or pain, blessing or cursing without it 
or affecting you. So when you, when you attack your mate, it is like you're attacking your body. And I said I've never thought about it like that before, but very true. You're also attacking God's creation. It's time to let love change your thinking. It's time for you to realize your spouse is much a part of you as your hand, your eye, and your heart. So, to needs to be loved and cherished. And if she has brokenness and issues causing pain or frustration, then you should nourish and cherish her with the same love and tenderness as you would a bodily injury. If he is wounded in some way, you should think of yourself as an instrument that helps bring warmth and healing to his life. In a lot of this, think about how you treat your spouse's physical body. Do you, phys do you cherish it as your own? Do you treat it with respect and tenderness? Do you take pleasure in who they are? Or do you make them feel foolish or embarrassed? Just as you guard your safety and well-being of your own body, you should treasure every part of your spouse as a priceless gift. Whenever a husband looks into the eyes of his wife, he should remember that he who loves his wife loves himself. And a wife should remember that when she loves him, she's also giving love and honor to herself. When you look at their mate, you're looking at a part of you, so treat her well. Speak highly of him. Nourish and cherish the love of your life. And today's dare said, how can you warm the heart of your spouse today? Look for opportunities to bring warmth to the coldness in his or her life. If possible, give them the unexpected tender touch. Choose a gesture that says, I cherish you, and do it with sincerity. And it said, how did you choose to show that you cherish your mate? What did you learn from this experience? And I wrote, I try to show something to David when it comes to his pain. He talks about it, and I try to understand it, and I probably won't ever completely understand it, but I have been having a lot of pain and pressure and being uncomfortable with this pregnancy the past few weeks, so I can get a taste of what he is going through. Thankfully, mine isn't constant, and I know there is an end in sight. David said he doesn't think he could do it if it was constant, even though it is pretty close, and he hoped the end of the pain is near. All we can do is pray. We, he, finds relief somehow soon and the doctors can help him. He was talking about his pain while standing in the kitchen and I just started lightly rubbing um, his back, letting him know that I was listening to him and I care about him and what he is saying. What I've learned from this experience is that I need to show David I cherish him more and really show compassion to him during this time. I may have not shown as much uh, the longer he's been in pain because he's been in pain for a while so maybe I've done it a little less than it was in the beginning because I, I said it's because it's been a while but I still need to show him I care about him and his pain. What a bubble burst that goes with this is answering him. Jesus said, what do we want me to do for you? And that's Mark 10:51. And I said, I underlined, what do you want me to do for you? And I said, I need to make sure I keep asking David this. <laughs> and somebody who um, who has done this before, and um, the love there is, she said, some dares seem almost impossible at first, but the reward has been so much greater than the risk and setbacks. Her name is the Dean. All right, that is it for this video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and, and hit that bell. So, sorry, James is very excited. Um, so you'll never miss another video. And make sure to come back next week for the next part of the Love Dare Challenge. See you then. Thanks. Bye.